to announce the launch of our new logo. We have evolved since our incorporation in 1997 and it is time to refresh our new look to reflect who we are today. Before I reveal our new look, however, walk with me while I take you through our journey of the last 25 years. Trust Bank was incorporated on July 3, 1997 and began operations on October 1, 1997. Following the collapse of the parent company of its predecessor, Meridian, the CBG stepped in and recapitalized the bank and held the shares in trust, thus the name Trust Bank. In 1999, the first investors who responded to the IPO and paid $1.50 per share received their maiden dividend of 50 bututs per share. In 2000, the bank fully paid back its investment by declaring another dividend of $1.20 per share, making it a cumulative dividend per share of $1.70 which was 20 bututs above the purchase price. Between 2002 to date, share capital has increased from $27 million to $200 million, indicating that the bank has grown organically by plowing back profits to increase capital, while at the same time paying dividends to shareholders. The bank was listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange in November 2002, being the first ever cross-border listing in the sub-region. Now let's talk about awards. The bank was awarded the insignia of the National Order of the Republic of the Gambia, ORG, in the year 2010 by His Excellency the President of the Republic of the Gambia. During the past years, the bank has received so many national and international awards. Banker Magazine, six times. Global Finance, six times. Gambia Chamber of Commerce and Industry, five times. We began operations with three branches. Now, we have 18 branches and 20 ATMs and counting. On digital services, mobile app, Check. Online banking? Check. Transaction alerts? Check. Watch this space. We've got more coming. Creating employment? Yes, we've got that too. 400 and counting. And we take great care of our people too. Medical insurance, life insurance, private and state pensions, annual pilgrimages for both Muslims and Christians, training? Yes, we do them all. One team, one family, one goal. That's the Trust Bank spirit. On corporate social responsibility, we have spent over $50 million in various courses. We care, and so we share. Over the years, we have paid over $1.6 billion to our shareholders, which translates to a whopping $20 per share and counting. Phenomenal returns for our shareholders who purchased at $1.50. Corporate taxes, over $1 billion paid. Our journey started with a vision to create the kind of company that delivers quality services and innovative products with an inspired team dedicated to serving our customers, our environment, and our communities at large in the most caring manner. We remain fully committed to delivering excellent services to each of our stakeholders, customers, employees, shareholders, and partners. So, we remain true to who we have always been. As we look forward to greater achievements, we are rebranding to reflect who we are today and the future that we inspire. Our new logo has been designed to visually demonstrate our Gambian heritage and the sophisticated nature of the bank. We are moving away from the navy and gold-colored parallelogram-shaped logo to our baobab tree with a rising sun in the background. The striking outline of a baobab tree at sunrise is a familiar sight to anyone who has spent time in the Gambia. Our new logo and visual identity are inspired by our core values and spirit of being a pioneer in providing a unique banking experience. It is a completely new look that better matches the transformation we have made as a company. But we remain your trust bank. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular honor to present to you our new logo and corporate identity. For the first time in the history of the Gambia, Gambia Printing Publishing Corporation proudly introduces the Bibliomatic Exercise Book Printing Machine. The machine has the capacity to print more than 20,000 books per hour. Yes, 20,000 books per hour. It also prints magazines, newspapers, calendars, flyers, normal books and all kinds of printed documents plus items at affordable prices. 
With the Bulomatic printing machine, GPPC can now render high quality and non size restricted printing service supply across the sub region. Rush now and partner with GPPC for all your public and private printing service needs. Print with us today and you'd be offered highly professional, reliable and efficient service delivery by our team of experts. The Gambia Printing and Publishing Corporation is here to meet all demands and is reliable at all times. For more info, contact us on 437-4493 or 437-4402. GPPC is Gambian and it's yours. On the reason I have always called for a national dialogue is because a government must be responsive to the needs of its people. Fatu. Tell me one thing, if I'm me as think? an individual, if I know that there is somebody that I definitely wrong, yeah. I will be bold enough, I will go to the party, to I will appeal to him and apologize him. decision today because I don't make decisions lightly. I investigate. I do my research. I get the facts. I call the experts. I, I summon meetings. I get the technician. Then I reflect and I make a decision. Why did you lose the election? Well, we lost the election because of people and registration. We had evidence of people being registered before the opening of the registration. Hello and welcome to another edition of our show. It's another Thursday and I'm glad to be here to, you know, bring you another show. Of course, today uh, with me, uh, I have Larry Sisse. Larry is former Secretary General and also somebody who worked in the UN system extensively. We will be talking about the state of our economy. We will be also talking about the assets recycling. Obviously, we know the Gambia, you know, is, enter, is trying to enter, whether they have entered in an agreement uh, with Africa 50 for our bridge. And also, we will be looking at other governance issues. But of course, what is trending today, Uncle Larry, welcome to Kerfatu first. Thank you, Kerfatu. I don't know if I'm allowed to say uncle, because everybody calls him Uncle Larry. So, but he's a Sisekunda, so I can call him any name, right? You can call me um, yes, but uh, welcome to the show for the first time. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. You have a very nice setup here. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. And of course, today we will start with what is trending. Normally, we do that. What is trending in the country? What is trending today is the uh, the resumption of Chiamari and Kubadavo's case. Yeah. Uh, I want to remind the viewers that um, I'm sure um, some two years ago, when the three years Jodna had their case in the courts, mm -hmm. um, they they were released and then rearrested, and then during that, you know back and forth, um, the, the current chairman, who was then a lawyer, was part of the three years Jatna, made yeah. a statement yeah. that was uh, made against uh, the, the, the judiciary and I think the president. Uh, but according to what we, we, we know, uh, the judicial committee, I think the lawyers or the disciplinary committee met over it and they sat over it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was told to, um, apologize. to apologize, which he gladly did. And I think once that was done, I think the judiciary really took a back seat from the case. But the IGP did not. The IGP continued with the case. And the case has been going on for the past two years. And then Yankuba ran for elections and became yeah. the chairman of uh, West Coast region, and he won overwhelmingly and in the in the mayor, uh, chairmanship election in Brikama. And uh, last, I think, according to his lawyer, when the judiciary withdrew their case, they thought the case was over, yeah. and they put in a no to uh, no case to answer, and that was pending there until. Uh, August 18th, 17th or 18th, mm -hmm. the judge ruled that um, Chairman Dabo um, have a case to answer yeah. and he should definitely come and open his defense. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people think this is politically motivated and today the case resumed at the high court. But again, it's been uh, the case has been uh, adjourned. adjourned. Now, what we knew before we came here was that uh, Chairman Dabo's lawyers, LS Camara, um, did file um, something at the High Court mm -hmm. because they believe that during the uh, ruling of the no to case, no, no to no answer, no case to no answer, case to answer mm -hmm. the judge, the judge, the magistrate made something that already showed that he was going to convict. Yeah. You know, because I, I think I have this in here where he said. Uh, he said something that was really, uh, somebody brought it to my attention yesterday and said, um, actually, if you read this, it seems like the judge has already made a decision that um, Yankuba will be convicted. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, he said, it, it is uh, in fact that a, a dictator government being called Baro can be no other person than the president of the Republic of the Gambia. Be that at is, as it may, the evidence before this court is is found to be sufficient enough upon which the court can rely for a conviction they are hereby rendering the no case to answer submission you know not generally. Mm -hmm. so what that is saying is that the court the even though the the judge has not even heard from mm -hmm. chairman Dabo's defense he has already made it known that the evidence he has is you know can 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 give him a conviction mm -hmm. so i think that is what uh, ls is challenging saying that already even without hearing from his client the judge has made up his mind so he's challenging it at the high court so today when he went to uh they went to the magistrate court i'm mm -hmm. being told that that's what um they have put into to say they want the judge to suspend this other case whilst they hear from the high court now the judge has set the ruling for that for september 25th um there were a lot of supporters there they had issues with the police today yeah. Um, I think I was told, my reporter told me, and the cameraman told me there were tear gas that were thrown yeah. at the supporters and also, and that's something that I think a lot of us said, you know, uh, in this day and age, uh, why do we have, number one, the water tank cars outside? Uh, why do we have tear gas? People can go out and support whoever they want to show solidarity with when they escort kids. But what is your own observation to this case? Thank you, Fatu. I think... Um at face value, mm -hmm. you would realize that um, this is not a legal issue anymore. I think it's a political issue. Why do you think so? Because um, the case has been going for some for two years yes, now. Why but, do you think so? But but you said it yourself. Mm -hmm. The the judiciary's disciplinary committee has met on this. Yeah. And they asked the individual to apologize. He apologized. As far as that is concerned, the judiciary didn't take any further disciplinary action on it. Yeah. Um, secondly, I think uh, once that was done, the apology was done, I think he was pardoned. 
he was pardoned? I think he was. I, I stand to be corrected Correct. on okay. it. But either way, mm -hmm. uh, why wait for three years uh, before they bring this case to the fore again? You, 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 you have to take it from the point of view of the lack of transparency and, and uh, 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 transparency and integrity in the process of how we are treated under the law. In if you say we are treated who? Uh, average people. Uh, the average people. Average okay. people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in one of my appearances in another uh, network, uh, network mm -hmm. I said we have unified laws in this country. Laws that are meant to treat everybody equally, yeah. which is called equality under the law. Mm -hmm. And then there is the issue of equality before the law. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in a case like this, yeah. uh, I am sure Dembo by force standing in front of the president and insulting Mandinkas and others within his entourage. Mm -hmm. Uh, could have been charged. Yeah. They haven't been charged. Yes. Now, nobody is making an, ap uh, uh, an apology for what Yankuba had done. Yeah. He was counseled, and based on that counseling, he came out and apologized. Kafoko, you know, na maninka kunda, ne kodolike, kebal kafo ene menka amanke siloti, then you you apologize and life continues. Okay. But this, this business of equality before the law mm -hmm. is a good example of how, the, how selective our judiciary system uh, continues to be. Is it the judiciary or the police? Well, because the judiciary is just there to kakiti uh, kundu, but police are like a mall somebody. By the new case is the IGP versus Yankuba. The judiciary will discipline the hajo. No, Idabe Hajo Tole. Idabe Jail, okay. Yes, Idabe Jail. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, particular case, okay. um, the IGP brought a case before the judiciary. Mm -hmm. The judiciary can, can basically say, based on previous counseling, this is no case to be answered. Okay. Life continues. Okay. But if you decide to hear it, you are basically treating somebody very differently from another person. Yeah. And if you are accused of political bias, there is no way you can shed that off. Mm -hmm. There is no way. Now, weaponizing the judiciary, weaponizing state institutions against uh, opponents is a classic textbook methodology that African leaders use. Yeah. And this, this current dispensation is not any different than that. I believe if we really want to say we fought a dictatorship, we dislodged a dictatorship without a shot being fired, yeah. and we had a, a, a president who was elected by the people, and that president had some of the best goodwill mm -hmm. anybody can have in the world from the donor community, uh, from, from the international community, from citizens, citizens groups. Mm -hmm. Barrow had a bunch of goodwill at his disposal to take this country in a different direction. Mm -hmm. In my view, he hasn't capitalized on that. Just take the... the uh, Brussels donors meeting, mm -hmm. the kind of goodwill that was shown to the Gambia in that donor conference, the amount of money that was pledged, and the amount of money that the government was able to track and bring back into the country, yeah. then you realize that the goodwill was there. We just squandered it. Now, you said something which is very important, and you are not the only one who says that. I have personally said that, and mm -hmm. I think I've seen other people say, at some point, when citizens feel that they are less Gambian than, than others, others, they mm -hmm. feel like a certain state institution is treating them differently. Mm -hmm. um, I have said, I've seen uh, on WhatsApp audios where other people are saying, oh, but Rambo said this. Yes. Oh, but Dembo by exactly. said this. Oh, but that lady before the election who yep. insulted everybody yeah. uh, said this. Mm -hmm. And somebody also insulted Jolas did this. Yeah. But they are not questioned, they are not taken to court, they are not prosecuted. But when other people are Do prosecuted, mm -hmm. and then, you know, people, I mean, the fact is you see it, and when you say they think you are being politicized, but it's no. out there. When, once a, 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 a country is like that, or as people feel a certain way like that, what kind of situation are we putting ourselves in? You, you are feeling like a second-class citizen in your own country. Mm -hmm. 
uh, by the selective use of the judiciary to try or, or not to try people. Now, like I said, um, when there is uh, transparency, um, there is uh, respect for the rule of law, and there is accountability in a governance system, mm -hmm. you don't see things like this. Equality under the law, equality before the law. I'm not a lawyer, but these are principles that we all know about. Yeah. If you try Yankuba on a case like this, you should try them both by force. You should try other people who have done other things more serious than this. But I think the issue is um, the, the, the idea of going after one's opponents and neutralizing them politically is what is at play now. What they are misreading is the mood of the people. People are, people are tired in this country. I think when you look at the cost of living, you look at how uh, much Nawek and, and the other uh, utility companies charge us for basics like water, electricity. These are basic human rights issues. When you put all of that together and you look at the salary levels, you realize that the, the, the trajectory of the economy is really not on track. And our concern ought to be, how do we bring the country back on track to take care of these issues rather than going on political vendettas against your opponents? I think, I think they are misreading the mood of the people in this because people are not going to uh, accept being, being made second-class second citizens in their own country, no matter how you look at it. And then today I was I was watching a live feed and I saw the women singing Never Again. Yep. They were saying Never Again in Mandinka. Yeah. Saying they will not accept what had happened yep. before. Yeah. I mean, in five years, ago, 20 years ago, like 10 years ago when Jame was here, you never dreamed something like this, that people can come out. The level of awareness has changed. Yeah. But also, um, looking at the situation in the sub-region, you see what is happening in Senegal. A lot of people are saying, uh, Maki, I mean, Makisal has used the state, all the state resources yep. against his number one uh, opponent. Mm, opponent. And people are just likening this situation to, to, to that. that. Mm. Do you also have a feeling it's something like that? I have said it. I, I think what they have done is to scope their political environment. By that I meant they looked at the different personalities within the UDP uh, in order to cancel them out. Who is our most potent potential opponent in 2026? And you begin to strike them out one by one. Yeah, I, I think that, that are you worried though? That brings mm. my next question. <laughs> There's a commission undergoing right now. Yep. And that commission, you guys, the UDP people said the target is Talib, Rohilo, Lanisane, yep. and yep. Kode Danjo. Yep. Right? That's, that's what we said. That's what they said. And mm. now the newest chairman also. I mean, a lot of people say these are one of these people are the potential presidential candidates yep. for UDP in the future. If all of them we see a chance of because the Yankubas if Yankuba is convicted, I don't pray. That means his, his, his political his, career is yeah, over. It's over yes. And if any of these chairmen mm. or mayors also have, you know, a ban, public office ban from the commission, we, if it's not overturned by the courts, they are done. But that's what Does I, that mean, you know, the UDP is Baroka or UDP Fala? No, <laughs> UDP level Baroka. But still we talk in Baroka said he's a political animal. And I, I'm beginning to believe that. No. All of the games that you see them play. No. Baro, Baro is, I think, inherently a decent person. I think what Baro is doing is not going to end well politically for everybody for anybody. Okay. It's not going to end well. Mm -hmm. Now, these commissions that you are talking about, yeah. so far, what has the commissions established? The commissions have established that the chief executive officers, the yeah. accounting officers, yeah. the auditors, mm -hmm. the finance managers, mm -hmm. who are all appointed by the local government ministry, yeah. are the most culpable in all of the corrupt initiatives that are being uh, investigated and are coming to light. Mm -hmm. So far, yeah. Rohi Malik Lo, the mayor of Banjul, hasn't been implicated in anything. Talib Ben Suda KMC hasn't been implicated in anything. Landin Sane in LRR hasn't been implicated in anything. So you see, if you look at the political scoping of your environment, you are basically saying one, two, three, four are potential 
contenders for for my uh, for my political uh, for, for my political future, mm -hmm. and then you go out to neutralize them one by one. Yeah. Now, a convicting young Cuba would be rather unfortunate. Yeah. Because this is a young man who has devoted a lot of his time and energy to this country. Yeah. And for political whims and caprices to be used to just neutralize him, I think is not acceptable. Are you confident that Cuba will have justice? You know, I mean, are you confident that, you know, he, I, I don't even know how to put that, but <laughs> with the way this case is going, uh, it doesn't uh, look good uh, for with, him. With this government having weaponized the, the state institutions, against mainly UDP, because UDP is mainly at the receiving end of all of these things. Having weaponized state institutions, having weaponized the judiciary, I have no confidence that Yankuba will get a fair trial. You said it yourself. Somebody sent you a message. The judge had already decided that this man is culpable. And so therefore, there is a potential to convict. Now, you bring somebody to court, before you even hear the case, you the adjudicator, just made up your mind that he's guilty. Do I have confidence in the process? No. But I think I have confidence in the inherent goodness of Gambians to say that they are not going to allow themselves to be used the way Yaya had used us. Because that would mean that everything we fought for, for 22 years, 2016 election and after, have all gone nil. It means we haven't learned anything. It means we haven't uh, even begun the process of doing that serious mindset change that can say that I can act fairly against my opponent and without uh, um, uh, designating that opponent as an enemy. We are Gambians, same family. Political differences shouldn't be translated into being enemies politically. I, I, and I think... Um, for, for everything that it is worth, I am not confident that uh, Yankuba will be, will be treated fairly. And where does that leave us, the people of West Coast region? Um, well, um, I think Yankuba had uh, 77,000 votes, West Coast. Gita had his own share of the votes. Another opposition person had uh, her own share of the votes. I just think uh, West Coast is going to be under siege. But I have the, the, the belief that uh, West Coast is one of the most resilient regions in this country. Uh, from, from the days of the pre-independence, agitation for independence to independence, post-independence Gambia, West Coast had always played a leading role in making sure that we break away from the yoke of the colonials. And I think West Coast has proven time and again, that they are, they are aware of what the imperatives for this country are, and they act accordingly. So I think when the time comes, West Coast will act accordingly, and they will come up with a solution. They will come up with a solution. Yes, I am, I am confident of that. Yeah. Until then, mm. uh, the case now is at the mm. High Court uh, and also at the Magistrate's Court. At the court. Magistrate's Court, So yes. 25th is the next uh, ruling on mm. whether the judge will want to proceed or yeah. he will wait for the ruling from the high court. Yeah. So we'll monitor that and of course whatever happens we will bring you details on that. Now let's look at why... Let, let, me, let me say before you go there, okay. I, I think this particular magistrate mm -hmm. should see his way clear to just recuse himself from from this case based, okay. on, based on the announced pronouncement that he made. He should recuse himself from it. Oh, that's what you think? That's what I think, yes. Okay. Oh, that's what they're also challenging at the high court. Well, yes, he should recuse himself. As a professional, you don't make up your mind and verbalize what your mind is made up on before you even hear a case. In any other dispensation, you would rec recuse yourself or you will be reprimanded by that, that same judiciary committee that reprimanded Yankuba. Well, let's see. Well, since the case is at the high court, yeah. especially on that uh, issue, mm. let's see mm. what happens at the high court. Yeah. Now, going to the topics that we'll be discussing today. First, what is your assessment of the state of our economy as we speak today? You know, Fatu, I kept saying in different fora in my social media mm -hmm. platforms that uh, uh, Gambia is off track. Off track? Yes, Gambia is off track. It's economically off track. It's politically off track. 
Now, culturally, I think uh, we are fighting among ourselves in terms of uh, uh, having tolerance for each other and having respect for the diversity that is the strength of this country. Now, when I say it's off track, mm -hmm. your, your viewers and listeners out there, those who are in the government who have knowledge of how economies work, we realize that our, our macro macroeconomic fundamentals are all wrong. What are those fundamentals? What are those? Uh, statistics for unemployment, mm -hmm. uh, growth rates, uh, fiscal monetary policy, international trade, and uh, supply and demand. Those are the fundamentals. Now, you pick any one of those except for the growth rate. Uh, we are being told by this government that we are growing at between plus 6 or plus 7 percent mm -hmm. annually. Yeah. The question I always ask is, you as a consumer, when you go to the market to buy your food basket, do you feel the economy is growing at no, 6 or 7 percent? No, I don't. Nobody does. I don't. Now, for some of us who have worked in the international arena and have uh, gotten out of it after... Um, a sizable number of years and are getting some type of pension. The only thing that is cushioning me from falling below the poverty line is the fact that my pension is being paid in US dollars. If it was dollars, I would have been in the poorhouse. No questions asked. Now, take any other fundamental, our international trade regime, our, our macroeconomic, uh, fiscal, and monetary policies, they are all out of work. Um, how many times since President Barrow came to power, or I should say even during Jammeh's time, mm. how many times have we seen the finance minister go before parliament to ask for a supplementary appropriation? I mean, now it's every year, right? It's twice a year. Twice a year, right? Yes. Now, every, yeah. It, yeah. Now, it, it basically means we don't have budget discipline. Okay. Or we don't know what we are doing. Because if you, if you sit down, you get feedback from all the ministries in terms of what their needs are. And you decide Ministry A is going to get that, Ministry B is going to get that. And you went to Parliament with a bill. Mm -hmm. Parliament passes that bill. You have no business going back to parliament and says, whoops, I made a mistake, I need more money. Question is, how do, how do they get that money? They go to the central bank for the money. Yeah. The, the latest appropriation was $825 million, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in order to complete the butter harding construction work. $825 million. $825 million. million. So that means you have under cost that project by 825 million. million. Yes. That's what you have undercosted it. Now they give you that money. Where is central bank getting that money? They are printing money. Printing that money leads to inflation. It, it's, you know, people wonder why are we in such a, a massive inflationary spiral. We are in this inflationary spiral, yes, because there are international global headwinds that the economy has to deal with. But fundamentally, we cannot keep living beyond our means. Mm. The more money you, you print from the central bank to give to the finance minister to, to, spend. To, to spend, the more your inflation rate goes up. Nobody can quarrel with, with that as, a, as an essential function of how budget discipline can help tamper inflation. So, international trade. What is Gambia's trade balance? Have you ever heard of this government coming out publicly and say, this is our trade balance? We are in deficit or in surplus in, mm. in terms of our international no, trade. No, nobody, they don't talk about it. Why do you think they don't talk about it? Because it doesn't exist. If, if they were to come out honestly, publicly, and say, this is our trade balance, this is our balance of payments, People are going to be up in arms to say, no, 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 this cannot happen. If, if you are a yard owner, mm -hmm. you, you head a household, do you think you're going to behave in such a way that you're going to project your expenditure for the year and you go and spend 50% of that before you even get to half a year? You won't do that. You won't do that. And if you, are, if you are a household owner, a head of a household, your household will crash. Yeah. So 
It's the same thing with the country. The only reason why the country is not crashing is because the central bank is giving them more money. The question is at what cost to the central bank, at what cost to, to the, the economy? economy, at what cost in, our, in terms of our cost of living. The minister updated the president recently and said um, the country, the, um, actually what he said was when he went to the National Assembly, the reason why they spend so much is because I think the, the monies that we get from the international partners were delayed. They mm -hmm. haven't come for the fourth mm -hmm. quarter. So what mm -hmm. does that mean, though? Because I said this the other time. Our budget is largely dependent on foreign aid. Foreign aid. Yeah. And if the minister is telling us that we didn't have any of those coming in in the fourth quarter, what, what, what does that mean? Why is that? Why is that? It should be a it should be a, a wake-up call to Gambians to know that we have a crowd that really do not know what they are doing. If the minister goes to tell the president, um, we 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 are in such a mess because the people who normally will help us are not helping us or at the levels they usually usually help us. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us? That tells us that we we are not actually in control of our own country and our own economy. Somebody out there, mainly the bilaterals and the multilaterals, multilaterals meaning the IMF and the World Bank, they are the ones who are giving budget support to this country. Yeah. The minute that budget uh, support stops, where do you think we're going to end up at? Do people really realize that um, in the last two, three, four months, uh, a lot of people are not getting their salaries on time? Central government? Yes. A lot of them are not getting their salaries on time. We hear them complain about it in social media. We hear them. Co I was at the bank at the end of last month, um, and and basically there was not enough money to 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 dispense. And people were complaining, my salary, my salary, and that was during Tobaski. So these are all telltale signs that the economy is not on the track that it should be. Now. I'm sure they're going to come out and say, oh, what he's saying is bogus. But those who, whose salaries are not getting paid on time, those who go to the bank, want to get dollars out of their dollar accounts and cannot get it, will testify that this is what is happening. Ah. I'm, I'm one of those people. You're one of those people. And Mr. Mr. Sisi, one thing I see that it seems like is going to be the new trend for this government is asset recycling. Yes. Now, the bridge, um, you know, they, they have gone into partnership with Africa 50. Before the minister is even able to tell us Gambians or the parliament, he gave an interview, and that's how we got to know about yeah. it. Now, I did remember the minister saying that they were making almost 50-something million every month. Yeah. Multiply that for 30 years. You're looking at almost about 300 million. million that's yes. what the final economics say. That's the average revenue it will give them for mm -hmm. 30 years. Now, they are recycling that, and Africa 50 is giving them 100 million. A lot of people said it's undervalued. But the worrying thing is this the government is setting up a commission. Mm -hmm. This commission, the mandate is to look at the SOE, state owned enterprises. Yeah their performance, to see whether they, are, they, they, they should be recycled, to see how much money they are making. Mm. Now, the, and I, there was this conference that also happened at the, at the, uh, at the OIC, and yeah. it was all about how we should privatize, how we should recycle. Are we looking at a new trend where our state-owned enterprises or our government institutions will be either recycled or being sold or for some reason because that is this institution that is tomorrow is the inauguration is specifically set up for that and yes. the minister yesterday two years ago went to, me, to brief the president and his specific words mm. state of enterprises are weak mm. they are financially weak they are not making money they are in debt for over 34 billion all of that i know yes companies like now gamtel gamsel are struggling but again should that be the way to go about this? Especially when it comes to companies like Gamtel. These are infrastructures that have been built over years. I, I, Fatou, I tend to describe all these state-owned enterprises 
as uh, our strategic assets. These are the country's strategic assets. Asset, yeah. Strategic in the sense that uh, we don't want our telecommunications system to be owned by a foreign, foreign. element. Mm -hmm. You don't want your electricity grid to be owned by another foreign element. Mm -hmm. And you definitely don't want your port, your airport, your Kairawa conference centers mm -hmm. being all leveraged for instant money. The reason why you asset recycle mm -hmm. is because institutions are weak. They are not making profits. Okay. But do we, do we look at these institutions and say, and ask ourselves this question, mm -hmm. why are they weak? Why are, why they, are weak? they not making profits? Mm -hmm. they, are, they are weak, they are not making profits because the government is taking their resources away from them. Mm -hmm. Now, when the, when the minister says the, the state-owned enterprises owe 36 billion, yeah. well, his government owes 110 billion. His government. His government owes 100. And the Gambia's loan portfolio today yes. is 110 billion. Mm. So 36 mil billion is a drop in the bucket compared to that. Compared. Why don't you just restructure the state-owned enterprises, make the boards independent to do the job of an independent institution, let them get the resources that the country needs to develop. During Jawara's time, nobody talked about recycling because these state-owned enterprises were making money. Amazing. Come tell me. We saw how much money the Jana Commission revealed from J uh, Jame's time in terms of how much money they get from Gamtel, from the ports, yeah. and from the other institutions. Mm -hmm. So it's a bogus claim that they are not making money, they should be recycled so for, for effectiveness and efficiency. They are not effective, they are not efficient because you are not effective, you are not efficient. If you are effective, you are efficient, you would have restructured them. Even make it possible for employees of those institutions to own shares in those, in companies. those companies. Like um, Sonatel. Yes. Employees own, employees share own shares in there. Sonatel, if if yeah. they have a stake in the, in, the, in the institution, they will do what is right for the institution. Yeah. Now, I want to come to this issue of the, the bridge. Yeah. At some point, didn't the minister say they make something like 60 million? Yeah, around 50 to 60, 60 million, around million. that. He said 50 something, Ibrahima yeah. said that it's, you know, it was in between, but they, around they, that, they, they, give they were very figures, different but different it figures. was around that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if, if an asset is giving you that kind of money, mm -hmm. nobody is telling you that asset is not performing. Nobody is telling you that asset is not uh, making a profit. Nobody is telling you that asset is not strategic for the country. Why would you go and recycle it for 100 million? Let them come out and tell us what they are up to. You know, I always say to this government, mm. your Achilles heel is your lack of transparency and accountability. What do you mean? Let, us, let them tell us what they are actually up to. We, let, them, let them bring out those contracts. Okay. Standing there and telling us we've signed a contract, they're going to give us 100 million, and then State House issues a statement to, through their uh, director of communications on, on Twitter and say, oh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's 100 million. Mm -hmm. And we have already agreed it's 100 million. But the minister is saying we are still negotiating. Negotiating. The minister so said, my, my yeah. question now is, mm -hmm. are they in the negotiation mood or have they actually signed to recycle that, that bridge? They need to tell us that. Would, would, for, 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 for something like that, you work in the UN system and you know how these negotiations are done. Do you think with the right negotiating tools, we would have even made more than the 100 million that is being put on the table right now? Undoubtedly, um, there are Gambians who are eminently qualified to help this country go through this asset recycling thing. I am not one of them, mm -hmm. but I know a bunch of them who can do it. The issue we have is not leveraging the knowledge base that we have. This country, when you go abroad, by the time you respect the Gambia, just go abroad in these institutions and see how many Gambians are in key positions. Mm -hmm. each, of, each one of them are sharp as a razor blade. And you, then you come, to this, you come inside the country, what do you get? Mediocrity. This, this is a system where Barrow doesn't even know what, how to run this government. I mean, he's he, been running for six years. Yes, but through commissions. Through commissions. 
You think this commission that he just created for state-owned enterprises is going to do anything other than recommending asset A, asset B, C be recycled? No. That is not the answer. The answer is to re 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 reform those institutions, make it possible for the employees to get a share of those uh, institutions, and let them bring the, them back to profitability. And my thing is, I, 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 I was asking this, I don't know, what, what's your take on that? For example, I worked in one of those parastatals. I worked in a parastatals. Mm -hmm. When this is the time parastatals are making their budgets. When they prepare their budgets, they, it goes to the board, the board approves it. Yep. And it goes to the office of the president. Yep. It stays there for more than three years, three months, three months. or so. Mm -hmm. They look at these budgets, they approve it. Yep. Now, it's based on those budgets that these institutions spend. Yep. And if there's somebody, if you approve a budget for 100,000 for, 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 for Kirfatu, by the first quarter, you should see if they are working along that budget. If they are not, you reprimand yeah. them and call them to order. But at the end of the day, the finance minister says the economy is struggling. I mean, he didn't say it's struggling. He said the budget support that was supposed to come didn't come. The reason <laughs> why, um, the, the, I think they overspent a little, I think. Now, that means things are not like they wanted it to be. If you set up a commission, you are, you are employing a lot of people you're going to provide it's logistics it's for them. You're going to provide a host yeah. office this was not budgeted yeah, for exactly this was not budgeted for yeah. now you have to make provisions for mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. and also you are now increasing more on your budget is this the way to go is is this the way to go to mm -hmm. govern uh, considering what is happening in a, with our economy no right? it is it is not that's why that's why i alluded to earlier to say we cannot, uh, the country cannot be run based on commissions and committees. The government, the, the president personally has to take responsibility to lead this country. And if he wants to lead this country, he has to stay away from these commissions because they are an additional financial burden on the economy that hasn't been planned for. What, like what you just said, this commission on parastatals. Yeah. Now, that hasn't been budgeted for. Mm -hmm. But he's setting it up. Yeah. Where is the, the money? Where is the money coming from? From the consolidated funds, I guess. Which consolidated funds? There are no consolidated funds. If the consolidated funds are there, the the minister would not say our our partners haven't given us the the kinds of monies that they normally give us. For me, that's the telltale indicator that the economy is not working. When the minister of finance says uh, the economy is not attracting the kind of resources that we need to move in a certain direction, I know everything is wrong. Now, that same minister, uh, according to a standard newspaper, said they have asked the IMF to help them deal with corruption. How do you ask an international institution to help you deal with your internal corruption? Do we want to go through the list of corrupt activities that the Auditor General has highlighted again in your show like we have in the other shows? No, we don't want that. We are tired of that. Somebody needs to lead. And the best way to start leading is to have consequences. This country does not have consequence management. You can do whatever you want to do. It's with impunity and you don't pay a price for it. Consequence management will basically mean that there is somebody, the president himself, could be sitting and saying, no, he's not performing, get rid of him. X is not performing, get rid of him. But the president has put a hole on traveling. That means they're trying to cut costs because <laughs> they spend a lot of money is spent on traveling. Now, the president has put a hole on that. Nobody will be traveling, meaning we'll be saving on money, right? Is that not no. a good move? So, no, it's not like nobody will be traveling. At government uh, as, as, we are as we are talking, uh -huh. the vice president is going to go to New York to represent the president at the General Assembly. Isn't it? Mm, yes. That's true, yeah. How many people is he taking along? I think it's a small delegation this time. Small compared, compared to, to what? last year. How what last is year we do sound or when. What, so what is the number? That is the highlight. <laughs> yes. but this time at least. What is the number? I don't know the number at this point. I Variously on social media, they are saying about 25 people. The question is, does Gambia really need 25 people to go to the General Assembly? And that delegation includes four, four state ministers. 
in addition to the vice president. Mm. I don't want to name the country, but there is a country in West Africa. For, for the last three years, that president has been going to the UN General Assembly with three people. Yeah. It's the UN mission. There are UN mission that is servicing the president, president on the ground. The ground he yes. traveled with three people consistently for three years. Now, that, country, that country's GDP cannot be compared to the Gambia's mm -hmm. GDP. If that country can do that, why can the Gambia say, let the VP go with his permanent secretary or with the secretary general? Or and, the foreign, and the foreign affairs minister. And the foreign affairs minister, mm -hmm. because those are directly involved in the work of the VP at the, at the, G, at the GA. Yeah. And then have the permanent mission service the delegation. So this is why when, when it happened, I, I, I said, I, I am cautiously um, congratulating the president mm -hmm. for taking that step. step. But I am worried because there are two loopholes. Loophole one is travel that is being financed by outside entities, development partners, is perfectly okay. I, I know the UN sponsors uh, delegations them, yeah. to, to conferences. To that is fine. Yeah. But the issue of the statutory meetings, the question I ask, and I'm still asking, mm -hmm. is how many statutory meetings will the Gambia be attending in a 12-month period? Does anybody know? Nobody knows. And when you say statutory meetings, um, there is no cap on how many people can go to that statutory meeting. The General Assembly, I assume, is one of them. Mm -hmm. But there is no cap on how, ma how many people the Vice President can go to the GA with. Or let's say the Human Rights Council in Geneva. How many people can the Justice Minister and his delegation go to that statutory meeting? So these are the, these are the kinds of nitty-gritty things that we don't know anything about. And we know civil servants are very crafty in terms of how they can exploit loopholes for personal gain. I, I will not be surprised if people use the statutory travel mm -hmm. element yes, yeah. to, go, to go abroad and, tra and, and just go and, and, travel. and travel. Now still looking at the recycling, um, asset recycling, um, if we get that 100 million, right? Um, I hope we don't get it. You hope we don't get it? Yes. You hope we still continue? I hope to the bridge continues to be Gambia's Trans-Gambia Bridge. I hope it's not recycled. Mm -hmm. And I hope under no circumstance will a profitable entity like that will be recycled for anything. Okay. The, the mere fact that since that bridge opened, mm -hmm. uh, it has changed hands. First it was G, G, um, GPA or the ferry services that was collecting the things and then it was transferred to the GRA and then to the Accountant General's office. Mm -hmm. It tells you something is going on. Mm -hmm. And what is going on is not acceptable. This is a profitable asset. asset. It should not be recycled should under be. any circumstances. And recycled. that's why I keep saying, let them tell us what is going on. Have they or have they not recycled it? Yeah. Have they that, or have they not? Not recycled. That's the, that's the question I want to mm -hmm. ask and that's the, the, the question I want answers to. Because the reason, w I mean, a lot of people are asking this. When the minister uh, held a press conference, when, when, the, the, when after the interview and everyone started talking, why has it not been taken to the National Assembly? The minister said, no, it hasn't gone there yet because we have not signed yet. We are just, <laughs> you know. No, but, but at first, what did he say? He says, no, he doesn't have to go to the National yeah, Assembly. That's because, what he said first. And then he says, no, no, we are still at the negotiating stage. Yeah. And then State House comes out and says, no, no, 100 million has been agreed. So which one are we listening to? Which one are we listening to? Yeah. Ask the minister, which one are we listening to? I hope we can have the minister here to talk about these things. Good. But, but, he, but when he comes, mm -hmm. ask him to please not recycle that bridge. That is not the solution. That is not the solution. And no and other company, public entities should be recycled. We should look at how to make profit out of them. Profit this. out of them. Restructure them. Recapitalize them, make it open for employees to have a stake in those entities, and you will see some action. As it is, they have no stake in it. But a lot of people say well, companies like Nowak, 
where you know up to now we are not able to um, have stable electricity we have seen the world bank and other donor partners try really helping to 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 help no work but still you know it's it's not what we want it to be wouldn't it be right to privatize companies like that what do you think of that now whether we like it or not is a strategic asset in fact the most important strategic Sorry. asset Sorry. as far as i'm concerned mm -hmm. now look at what nigeria has done to niger mm. could it happens yeah ah boys go back to the barracks the boys say no i'm not going to the barracks Kaput. Cool. the light goes off is that what we want for now to be subjected to i don't even like this idea that we could be in a in the type of relationship that we are with Senegal. Senegal. Senegal, yes, yeah, Senegal. I, I don't like it. Yeah. Now, anybody who is a strategic thinker will know that you are actually giving your lifeline to a country to just switch on and off. So, now recycling it is not the answer. At one time, in another platform, I said, I have a radical solution for now. Mm, what's that? And, and I said, we should break it up into three. Yeah, water. Uh, w uh, no. Uh, transmission, distribution, and um, uh, network. No, no. Transmission, distribution, and um, uh, uh, I'll, 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 yeah. I'll, okay. I'll, 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 I'll think about it. But it should but, be break up. Into but three. I said it should be br broken up into three. three. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I said that is some countries have done it, and they've done it very successfully. You break it up, you make sure that the three entities either have a joint board or independent boards. But the, the important thing is the government has the majority share in each of those three entities. Transmission, distribution, and... Uh, is it the billing? And generation. Generation, okay. Yeah. Generation, transmission, distribution. Okay. You can do it that way. And you, st you restructure it again, you make it possible for no ordinary employees of NAWEC to have a share in NAWEC. And they see themselves being paid a dividend at the end of every uh, quarter. And that dividend goes to their bank accounts. And they actually see it. Now, when you do something like that, you will see how responsive employees can be. Because they have an incentive they for the company stake, to, yeah. make a, uh, mm. to make a profit. Yeah. As it is now, NAWEC is not going to come out of what it is in. It's not possible. Even with our best of intentions, I don't think the capacity is there. I don't think the resources are there for NAWEC to give us uninterrupted cheap power for 24 hours. It's not possible. The only possible way to do it is to go a radical solution way. If you can't do that, well, make sure the, 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 the uh, international institutions that are pumping money into NAWEC take the lead in restructuring NAWEC. Make it profitable, make it lean, make it mean, so that it can generate power, it can give us what. Look at what the, the, the people in Bundung did uh, yesterday he, when the president, president went was, to yeah. open that thing. As a Gambian, I don't want my president to be subjected to, ridicule, to that kind no. of ridicule. Yeah, nobody, nobody I don't want that. that. Yeah. Now, they can say, oh, he's UDP and so, but forget that. This is about the country. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with UDP or NPP. Or, it's about no, the I mean, country. It's the ordinary folks. I live in Bundung. It's the ordinary folks yes. who are suffering from water shortage. And they just want the, their president to know that this is what they're suffering from. I, I live in Kotu, mm -hmm. Kotu South. Yeah. In all of that area, you get water maybe 2 a.m. for 30 minutes. And that has been going on for more than 20 years. Wow. Nobody can tell me that can be resolved by now. It's not possible. But the OIC project that is coming, though, they, 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 they're, going to, they're addressing that, the water issues and also some uh, generation electricity issues as well. So you think that will be uh, helping to boost now? How, how long will it take before that comes online? I mean, they said 24. I had the OIC uh, CEO yes, last week. Mm. He said in 24 months, the, all of their projects will be done, including the roads, the water issues. And okay, in Let, let's start counting. I'm not hopeful. You're not hopeful? No. Okay. Now, one thing um, I am also, I wanted to bring here is, for example, if we take loans and grants, mm -hmm. or even if we recycle and get that hundred million, how it is invested. What we have seen with this government is 
um, investing a lot in infrastructure. Infrastructure that is not uh, bringing um, returns, returns mm. instant returns, mm. but infrastructure that helps to beautify or ease transportation and all this. But for example, if you invest in agriculture, you know that is instant returns that yep. are coming. If you invest in, in all the health, in, in health education. and all the education, mm. but you know we are yesterday the Ministry of Works were at the presidency to brief the president the number of roads. And I was listening to the minister and the number of roads and the projects that are coming, <laughs> it's a lot, but it's a lot of money. And these are, most of them are government funded projects. Is that the way forward in an economy like this? We are coming from COVID, you know, uh, inflation is high. Um, you know, we are not able to get local, you, uh, our donor partners are not forthcoming like they were before. Is this the way to uh, be economically independent right now? No. Y you know what? Uh, I think in my first appearance in one of, one of the platforms, I made mention of the fact that mm. it's well and good to have good, solid infrastructure. Yeah. Um, but infrastructure should be carried out, like the party leader has said in his press conference. Mm. It should not be at the expense of agriculture, health, and education. You have to find a way of balancing the investments out so that you cover those three key sectors plus your roads. The reason why I don't believe um, our guys understand the nature of infrastructure projects is that many years ago, I think it was in uh, 1989, 1990, mm -hmm. the OECD together with the World Bank, if I'm not mistaken, conducted a study of infrastructure projects in Europe, in North America, in Africa, in Asia, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, and the Caribbean. Conclusively, it showed that for most infrastructure projects, 90% of them, every cycle of that project is prone to corruption. So why do you think our presidents prefer infrastructure? Hmm. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say, when you look at everything that is happening around our infrastructure, mm -hmm. Are people in Banjul happy with the Banjul roads? No. Given the amount of money that was spent there? No. They are not. Now, these OIC roads that you are talking about, I think there is a good start in terms of building the foundation for a good infrastructure. infrastructure. But President Barrow, whether he knows it or not, is actually chopping at his own legacy. Have you ever driven on this road at night? Mm, no. Pay attention to driving on that road at night. The lighting system is bad. And I think the way they've constructed it without those railings on the sides, cars will be flying from the road into, into the ditch. It's just a matter of time. I'm, I generally don't drive at night, but the few times that I drove on this road, I was actually amazed at the fact that I'm not seeing 15 meters ahead of me because of the street lighting. Just look at the lighting, uh, the poles. I think it's also solar. Now, Baro had a good opportunity to make that a legacy project. But he's, he's, he's blown it if this is what he's going to hand well, over to it's people. Not, it's not yet ready. The roads well, are not ready. The, the lights this are ready. This is just the first phase. The, the lights are ready. Hopefully comments like this will make them rethink that lighting is very important in a main thoroughfare like this. There are cows and all kinds of stuff on these roads. People will be dying. And I, I don't want to sound um, uh, alarmist, mm -hmm. but just drive on that road at night or, or just ask your viewers, those who drive on that road, they will tell you mm -hmm. how difficult it is to navigate that road at night. For me, it's a legacy project. Yeah. And, and the legacy is going to be minimized because of the finishing of it. Now, you talk about other roads. Most of these roads are substandard. I had somebody, a colleague of ours in UDP, commented on the roads, and one of the ministers said he's not an engineer, he's not qualified to come. You don't have to be an engineer to know whether a road is good or bad. I mean, I did a video. I, I mean, when the Senegambia road was open, I was so amazed. It took me five minutes from my office to Senegambia, and I, I took a video and I posted it. I saw it. And 
under that video i said oh my god this is beautiful this is amazing this is the best thing that ever happened to gambia because that's how i felt yeah because the struggle it takes me to get to my office mm. and i was amazed that this road was quick there was no traffic and the comments i got on the video i was really scary and people were saying be careful these roads are not safe you know there's so much risk and i was like my point exactly how come i didn't see that dog yeah. no you didn't see it because you are used to substandard traffic yeah now this is an improved version of that substandard traffic and that's why you are able to sail through i i came from home mm -hmm. The, 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 the place that I had this biggest bottleneck yeah. was at the Senegambia roundabout. Mm -hmm. And that is because there is organized chaos there. Yeah. <laughs> Police everywhere, but nobody is moving. Mm -hmm. it, I, I timed myself. I spent 10 minutes just navigating that, that roundabout. Yeah. But once I navigated that roundabout, it took me seven minutes to get to be here. here. Yes. So the road is good in that regard, mm -hmm. but it could be better. Better. And if you if you compare it to international standards, it is not. You want to lay the foundation for infrastructure that will last you 25, 50, 75 years. These roads cannot give us that kind of uh, longevity in terms of uh, being structurally sound. It's not possible. Now, if you driven anywhere in Southern Africa, <laughs> Namibia, mm. Botswana, Swaziland. South Africa itself, Zimbabwe. Mm. If you've driven anywhere in those countries, you see roads that are going to last that long. Our roads cannot last that long because we build substandard roads. Now, the other thing is, there was a, I think a Jabang, there was a, a, a community in the Jabang area that mm -hmm. vi videoed the road that is linking them to another community. Yeah. And they were saying to the president, come and look at your road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To your own job around yes. the area, yes. Come and look at your road. It's a bad road. Now, that just, at least that one, they are doing something. I'll give you a classic example of what I mean by the corruption that goes with uh, infrastructure. Infrastructure. Now, Kudang and Kuntau mm -hmm. is just 18 kilometers. They are, they've started a road there. Yaya had started a road there in mm -hmm. 2016. I think it was meant to, to incentivize people to vote for, for him. Vote, yeah. uh, but the, the point is he has given a contract to a contractor to do that 18 kilometer stretch. Do you know that road is still not complete after four contractors? Why? They just take the money and go. Go take your team to Kudang and all the other feeder roads that uh, the president has been laying foundation stones on and see how many of them are actually taking off. Now, that Kudang Kuntau Road, people don't realize if it is done properly, mm -hmm. it opens up the economy from, from the main road in Kudang all the way into Kuntau, into Nyani. The, 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 the communities there will have an opportunity to participate effectively in, in the local economies. Yeah. What are the local economies? The lo Agriculture. Mm -hmm. hmm? Agriculture. Mm -hmm. Fishing. Yeah. Uh, and then these lumos. Lumos, yeah. Now, as of now, when you want to go from Kudang to... The nearest lumo? Yeah. The, the nearest lumo is in Jareng or in, in Brikamaba. But if you want to go to uh, Nyani, it's not possible. It's not possible. Wasu, Wasu has a very vibrant uh, lumo system there. And that road would have created a direct link to Wasu. So, um, I'm not saying infrastructure is bad. But if we do it, let's do it right. Let's do it right. Yeah. And let's make sure that uh, the contractors have the capacity to build the kind of roads that will last us 25, 30, 40, 50 years. Yes. Now, let's look at the new bill that... The Oof. Minister of Justice has just tabled at the National Assembly. Um, I am all for judges, people who dispense justice, justice, to be comfortable. Because that way they also, uh, you know, are able to dispense justice fairly. I am all in for that. Um, but I'm saying what um, this, because we had a new draft. And a lot of these things that we have seen in this new 
uh, bill is from that draft. Yeah. And the president, even yeah, last last state of the nation, said they are going to bring the draft back to the assembly. Mm. This year also, during the state of the nation address, the president again said the draft is coming back yeah, to, to, the assembly. to the assembly. Now, why do we have the attorney general picking stuff from the draft and bringing it as an individual bill? Because we all know. And I always say this to people. The truth is, sometimes we blame the National Assembly, but we also know that National Assembly is about numbers. Yep. This bill is going to be a simple majority bill. Yep. That is how it's going to It can pass even with one One, one person more. above. Yeah. yeah. So it, that doesn't mean that the National Assembly, all of them have voted, uh, have voted, have or, voted or for are it. necessarily for it. For it. Yeah. But the truth is, it is the numbers that plays in the Assembly. Mm. And the fact of the matter is, this is what the, the, the government knows. What, whatever they want to put out, they know they have numbers. Whatever they want to put, <laughs> they want to pass. They take it out of the body. It seems like that's what, we are, we are about to see taking stuff out of the draft and taking it to the assembly, passing them individually and leaving the draft behind. What does that tell us? It, it tells us that uh, we are still continuing to witness and experience the patronage system. This, our political system is a patronage system. Um, why do I say that? Mm -hmm. First of all, the president's personal emoluments are outrageously high. Can you tell me one president in the world that has in the budget a provision for his feeding? I know Biden pays for his feeding. No. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. He pays for his feeding. Yes. He even pays for his rent yes. in the White House. Mm -hmm. I know of other African countries, especially Southern Africa, who have a cap on how much can be spent on the president. Okay. Now, here it is alleged we have a president who is getting 150,000 Gambian dollars a day for fish money. The is that true? That's what is in the budget. Yes. But I'm saying... Can the president confirm or deny that? But they say that is the entire presidency and the office of vice president. Whatever it is. And the security is. and everything. State House is huge. Whatever it with is. With all the security teams and everything. Whatever it is. Kondon in Sima. Kondon in Sima. Kondon in Sima. Yes. Kondon in Sima. 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 Kondon in what I'm saying, though, is uh -huh. shouldn't he be rationalizing as a very first step if he wants to show Gambians that he's serious about cutting expenditures, about um, uh, the kind of patronage system that we have? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't he start it with that? Jawara Lawato, for the worker Kelly. Be in it at a state house. Akaboko Lako Fonko. It's like a new sinker ball. Akaboko Heudulal. That's how we have to do it. How do we have to do it? How do we have to do it? The president of the United States, 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 and say, this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. That is not acceptable. Konka Afonyame, Natra Numfanko, in that review process, mm -hmm. he says to Gambians, Nalonko President Dolfanang, they pay rent for their state houses. Mm -hmm. Yes, the state gives them water, electricity, and all of that. I'm, I'm fine with that. But give me something that I can use from my own emoluments to clothe myself and to feed myself and my family. Why should, why should you and I, taxpayers, feed him? Maybe at a sealer, maybe I can manage them. 
bar ni ko nte ko hore ran 50 dollars is ko par da walo every day o mansi ba fole yete bota min tole imam bo ture ko ndani baro ko nda wote bar ni baro ko a mansi wo mu baro ko ndan kolle ti asita la fa tambita anda nyanta leadership that la wol to let him start with that and show gambians that he can lead let him also look at the kind of things that is being fed to him nga nga video doleje recently on social media molba folako kanela moy la mol la men ya lon koy be dale bu ka tonya foy somebody was saying that it's a community now what that should tell the president is that he needs to listen to his ministers his permanent secretaries and all of that but he needs to also have a a sounding system yeah. that can link him to communities, communities to know what is going on on the ground yeah. as it is whether he is doing it or not I, i don't know but as it is he appears to be detached from the realities of the country and for me that's a very serious matter you cannot build a legacy by being detached from your people someone said to me the president should be the most informed person, person. and the, i think the president is the most informed president person in this country but i think like you said this one time when the president said man about to munyina i'm like yeah. and i which, asked which i said it on my show i said jumale ofo president because yeah. i just called the shop yeah. i just bought rice and it's not that so stuff like that when it, that happens and you know that's serious right that's you have been secretary general you know how governments work you know things like that when 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 things like that happen is that a serious wala mm nanko -hmm. he seems to be detached from the reality of his citizens mm. and that reality is uh ibe ibe men enjoy kan mm -hmm. he has no idea if he has an idea of what hardships people are enduring he is definitely ignoring it and i'm saying he needs to find a way to bring his nose down to the ground to have a, a a sense of the pulse of the people he is leading so still coming back to the judicial belonging eh kes nga min je generally nde i look at when we put posts on the page i look at the comments yeah and that exactly. tells you the mindset of, of the, the people kes <laughs> you know i see a lot of people mol mom balang kamol jo right to judiciary jo right it's the way you do it it's number one the way mm. and also how you do it for yeah. example i see a lot of people saying police all dung yeah. no so dung teacher no all dung lo tando kulal dung nga mo may bol fola but also the fact that this was all part of a whole package mm. the, the, the 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 draft yeah. and the president promised us that the draft is going to go yeah. um muna urgency ba caring for ateba to nola or is there something that um that you know maybe for a judiciary la ila uh, ila uh, budget sol ila payment sol month for tadulato they need to adjust it. but can our economy number one handle that and number two nayatra um does this also show called draft ni manala for what do you no, think no you, you know what i think uh -huh. uh, i said earlier i think it's a patronage system oh that that he's building Or, or that he is continuing because jamela system fanang be olenya it's not it wasn't a merit based system and this definitely is not a merit based system now why why do i say i think it's a patronage system a famala salary nala emolments he has taken care of that fourth he has taken care of his ministers they are taking care of the national assembly national assembly now it's the judiciary stuff yalo molka comments if i'm in case when you guys posted that thing, you know what they say it's a national osusu it's the turn of the judiciary to eat now do we want public policy to be subjected to that kind of ridicule no nobody is saying the judiciary shouldn't get a good salary i mean they should get a they, they should, should get, get a comfortable salary because they dispense justice, justice. and they should be people mini alon ko comfortable ta to the point mi alon ko era do ko te influence la by code on infengo so until i am all in for taking care of the judiciary but i think like you said um go akita nyami wala fa nay modia nobody is denying the fact that system wide mm -hmm. there is a need to review the salaries yes 
so that the salary scales can keep pace with the rate of inflation. Mm -hmm. The question is, do we have the money to do that kind of system-wide uh, salary review? We don't have, I don't think we have that kind of money. Okay. And so, because we don't have that kind of money, he's doing it piecemeal, based on where his priorities are. Ntengamirala priority sign, but he's taking care of himself, his cabinet, uh, the National Assembly. If he takes care of the judiciary, then the rest No will fall. Needs, police only in ah, They can wait. They can wait. But what he's failing to realize, what they are all failing to realize is that these are the people who make the country work. And you cannot ignore their, their economic plight for too long. The, the teachers, the police, the watchmen, uh, the healthcare workers, the doctors, these are people who are, they are very vital to how a country functions. You cannot go and start taking care of the top echelons of that system and forget about the middle and the uh, bottom rug of that. Ndema mm -hmm. along fang, uh, what kind of advice President Barrow gets. Mm -hmm. But until a time, as Secretary General, and I'm sure before mine, you have a chance to sit with the President every morning. You brief him security-wise with the security heads. And then at night, before you knock off, you have a recap of the day. That was when you start telling the President, ah, what are we going to do about it? Now, where is the Secretary General sitting these days? Our Secretary General is not even at the State House now. My point. It's not at the State House. Where is she? The Office of the President Secretary General is not at the State House now. I'm a moral prom. Santo. Yeah. Now, how, how, how do we justify that constitutionally? Because the position is not being abrog abrogated by the Constitution. Because we now... So, the, the, what is the difference between the Secretary General and the Chief of Staff? Because it seems like now... The chief of staff has taken more of that role. Is that um, um, if I'm taken, wrong, you know, I, I stand to be corrected. I don't know the inner workings there, but but the, what you see, what I see is this: the office of the secretary general should be at the seat of power, next the, to the office of not, the president. Not just at the seat of the power. The secretary general should be the gatekeeper to the president. To the president. That's what I'm saying. Next to yeah. the president. Now that has been put aside. Um, I, I, I don't want to be in that lady's position. I would resign. Because she has been totally sidelined and placed in a place where it used to be a private sector shop. Now, the person who is close to the president, as it appears now, is the chief of staff. Cody, yeah. is the chief of staff actually briefing the president on facts? Not political whims, not the caprices of the president, but facts that are in the economy, mm -hmm. facts that are in the political domain. Yeah. Is he doing that? Mm. If he says he's doing it, that's yeah. fine, but people are not seeing it. Wow. And, and, you know, I am an institutional person. Yeah. Um, I've, I've worked in the government before, the UN locally, abroad. I have seen how uh, efficient systems work. Our current system is not efficient. And if it is not efficient, it cannot be effective. If it is not effective, it cannot deliver the services that people require. What would it take to... to I mean, when this government came in 2016, mm. we all agreed that our institutions are not working. Yeah. Um, we don't have strong institutions. Mm -hmm. Um, the agenda was to have a new Gambia where we will have security sector reform. We will have our laws reformed. In fact, this sedition case that the Yankuba is being tried on should have been thrown out. Yep. I mean, this was the cry yep. during Jamez time. Mm -hmm. It is still on our laws. You see government officials telling you, Lual Manfali, Lual Mimbenu it hasn't changed. Mm. Um, our draft constitution has been thrown out yep. because of two things, two or three things. Um, our election laws are still the same, the same laws that 
sent solo something to 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 and um, uh, uh, to Bambadinka to Bambadinka and mm. he died they are still right? there and that is a lot of people say that mm. it was the catalyst for the change we're yeah. all enjoying today yeah. now electoral laws have not changed our draft is in coma uh, security sector reforms still struggling civil service that. reforms civil service reforms not done mm. now six years now i mean what do we need to do at this point we cannot continue at this rate what do we need to do i think i always say this um if this government fails it's us the people yep. and i think um i have said this to so many times government should not look at people's giving opinions as being opposition to them the reason why people speak is because we all have a stake if there's inflation today I'm, I'm suffering. Yeah. I'm going through that inflation just like the other, the other person in Basse is going through yeah. it. So me having And it doesn't matter whether you are NPP, it, UDP it or whatever. It doesn't matter where mm. you belong. Mm. We go to the same hospital. We yeah. pay the 40% increment of yeah. Nawek. Yeah. We all buy the same yeah. rice that is sold in the market. Yeah. So we are all going through the same, same thing. thing. So what do you think we need to do at this point? I mean... But I don't know. I don't know if we're seeing a different Gambia. You talk to the Minister of Finance, they will tell you we're doing well. Well, this is what I started with. I, and you started it also. Yeah. As far as he's concerned, we are doing well. Yeah. So the, if you the, say we're doing well, the, then, the, 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 then the, you don't see the problem. Then there's not, nothing to fix. Yeah, exactly. The, the issue that I ask, I'm going to ask again, yeah. is if you feel the economy is doing well, so well that it is growing at 6 7%. If you feel that, then there is nothing to fix. But if you belong to my type of people who are saying the economy is not e even growing at 1% and the inflation rate is around 13, 14, 15%, something needs to happen. Then, then the economy is not moving. Fatu, let us be realistic. Yeah. The IMF has just issued its global growth indicators. Mm. China will be growing at 2, 3% a year. The United States, 1% to 2%. UK and the EU, same bracket. Mm -hmm. Very few countries are growing at 3%. 3%. What makes Gambia so special that we could be doubling the IMF's projected growth rate? What is so special about this economy? Mm. Let people start asking themselves that. I, I don't think we are growing at 1%. I don't think so. Now, you, you sound surprised. And yeah. I will tell you why. Why? Now, a lot of the times we all blame the IMF this, the IMF that. But what people should realize is that the IMF de depends exclusively on the statistics that are given to it them. by the government. By the government, yeah. And who, give, who gives them that, those statistics? Finance Ministry, Central Bank trade ministry. Mm. So whatever you give the IMF, that's, what they that's the basis on which they will do their analysis. analysis. Now, you can say the flip side of that, the IMF can say, ah, no, 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 no. If, if all these big economies are growing at 1, 2, 3 percent, how is the Gambia growing for? If you ask those strategic questions, you're going to pin them down to bring down their growth rates. Now, it's one thing for the finance minister to say we are doing well. Maybe he's doing well. I'm not doing well. I'm not doing well. Too. Well, then, I'm not doing that. My cash power bill, I, I tell people, and you tell people they think she's lying. I used no. to pay $12,000, $12,500. Today I'm paying $17,000 for my home, for cash power. I'm alone. telling you, Fatu. What is my salary? I'm telling you, Fatu. I'm so spending this is what? something like $10,000 at my house for cash power. And it used to be around 2000 a month. I used to spend 12005 Today I'm spending 17000 17, so, on cash power alone. Maybe I'm even underestimating so, how much so, I spend so, on so, that. So that's, for me, I'm not doing well. Under, under Nobody is doing so well. It is, it's, I just hope. If, if the minister says the economy is doing well, then we don't have anything to worry about. But for those of us who say, no, 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 the, the, the economy is not doing as well as you think it is, then something needs to happen. And what needs to happen in terms of policy options? Um, you can introduce what are called palliatives. It's a series of measures that countries have done. Nigeria right now, when they suspended the, or uh, abolished that fuel subsidy, they issued, the federal government issued a bunch of palliative policies, mm -hmm. salary reviews, yeah. 
uh, cheap public transportation, available electricity at cheap rates, those kinds of things. Now, those palliatives, mm -hmm. uh, Gambia is doing, but in a very selective way. We have a fuel subsidy. Yeah. And I keep saying... I think they removed it. Yes, now. but I keep saying, yeah. I keep saying the people who benefited the most from that subsidy are the oil marketing companies. RMC. You and I with cars. The, the average Gambian on the street... Doesn't have a car. Doesn't have a car. Yeah. So you don't benefit from it. What would make it even more plausible for him to do is to create a public transport system that is cheap, that can cushion uh, uh, commuters from the high cost of fuel and the high co cost of running uh, those, those vehicles. Mm -hmm. Public transport system. This country should be, we should start talking about doing a good urban transit network that will alleviate some of the congestion we have in our, in our city. But more importantly, it will make travel cheaper, easier, and faster. Those palliatives are not there. Now, go back to 2017, 2018. Mm -hmm. I think Gambians forget these things. When, when COVID first started, mm -hmm. didn't the government give importers of basic commodities customs free yeah. access? Is that still on? As far as I know, it hasn't been rolled back. It is still on. But... Rice hasn't gone down. Rice, rice. No, none of the food basket items has, have has gone, gone down. down. Yeah. But they are bringing the stuff free. Who is benefiting from that? People need to start asking uh, about those issues. Now, this travel issue that we are all talking about now. Yeah. Uh, an MP has um, posted something on his Facebook page. And basically said, in the last three years, two, 2000 to 2003, mm -hmm. um, Gambia spent about $1 billion, $79 million in travel. In travels. To, as we are talking, $20 million is outstanding as on retired impressed. Now, it's for a small country like this. Will the anti-corruption bill when passed hopefully this session this before i was told by honorable Mahdi that they before the end of this session it will be passed if passed do you think that will help to alleviate all of these uh corruption allegations <laughs> that we we people bring up uh, will the bill be helpful passing a bill is one thing mm. creating the strong institutions the and the strong independent strong personalities men. men and women that can actually do the right thing is Africa's actually seal. It's not just here. But those African countries that have done headway on corruption, they have created good corruption, anti-corruption laws. Mm -hmm. They have created good, robust, strong, independent anti-corruption institutions. And they have appointed men and women of strong integrity to run these institutions. So passing the law will have to be complemented by these three aspects. You know, I, t I used to tell a story. Uh, I was transferred from one Southern African country to another. Mm -hmm. in, in, if I made mention of the year, maybe people will put one plus one. Already but I was, Nawek is making TP. Uh, yeah, they that? will go, right? We are just changing, yeah. switching to... Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So I was transferred to this country. Uh -huh. And you know what my baptism of fire was? Uh -huh. The week that I arrived, uh -huh. and I didn't even officially start functioning there. I came for a pre-assignment visit. Yeah. I was in the hotel. That six o'clock news. The chief justice, the president of the appeals court, four different high court judges, mm -hmm. two different ministers of justice have all been arrested for corruption. Wow. And that country had a robust anti-corruption framework where mm -hmm. anti-corruption courts can mm -hmm. be held even at night. Wow. Wherever it, the, the judge need it, needs mm -hmm. it to happen, it will happen. Mm -hmm. Wow. And they took these guys to court. Wow. Rapid response dispensation of justice. Mm. They were all found guilty and all sentenced to prison terms. Wow. No exceptions made. And then all of that was because these um, Panama Papers revealed that they had all these assets all over. And the government went after those assets. What they did was, everything that you owned, 
before you ascend to that position, they left you. Everything you own after that, they took. Now, tell me what is wrong with a robust anti-corruption system like that. Now, in our case here, money laundering is becoming an issue. And you cannot talk about corruption without the money laundering aspects of it. Mm. Look at the number of banks we have in, in the Gambia compa compared to the size of the economy. You have to wonder, where are they getting their profits from? I'm not saying they are laundering money, but I'm also saying they must be doing something to keep them going. What is that? Because it cannot be the output of the economy alone. If you, if you take the output of the economy alone, in terms of our banking sector, there will be less than three banks on Kairaba Avenue. Interest rates are the highest today. Ah, at 20, at 20. They, are, they, are, they are making their money from the interest rates mm -hmm. that they charge on loans. Yeah. They are also making it from the, the exchange rate differential. This, we have the, probably the poorest exchange rate, dollar to dollar C. Uh, Banks written. don't even have uh, foreign currency. You, you, you. Central government, central bank gives us rates every week to publish. Yep. And you know, you go to your local bank and say, "I want." They say, "We don't, they have, don't it. have it." And central bank doesn't even have it at that rate. You see. And you go to the local bureau that is seven dollars or ten dollars above what central bank is putting on paper. Yep. yep. What what that is telling you? Yeah. Is that the financial system is under stress? It's under stress because illicit resources are being moved around. Yeah. Those illicit movement of those illicit resources tend to affect the integrity of the financial system. A lot of people don't realize that, that these things are all connected. But what, what is a silver lining in all of this is that those who are illicitly transferring resources out of the Gambia into other countries, they think they are smart that these resources cannot be traced. They will be traced. They can be traced. Because now, the international system has closed in on illicit transfer of resources. And people are actively working on it, people with integrity. The AU has a, an illicit uh, transfer of funds initiative, which is headed by former president of South Africa, Tabo Mbeki. Mm -hmm. They are doing fantastic work recovering resources. So if, if you are doing that, you are buying properties in Senegal, in Guinea-Bissau, in Dubai, and you think, I'm smart, I'm going to... It will come. It will come. It's just a matter of time. It may take time, but it will come. Finally, uh, what's your take on the Malagan investigative report, um, which alleges that the Minister of Digital Economy, um, <laughs> his company, his personal company, has been awarded uh, over $700,000 to train staff of his ministry. Yeah. <laughs> now the minister said he didn't know he has resigned from that company but mind you this proposal came from the minister's company yeah. to the ministry yeah. and the ministry offered the contract their contract to, to his company yeah. i'm sure the minister at some point knew that <sighs> because uh, yes the permanent secretaries are the ones who deal with these things but of course the minister will one point at some point know that his company has been contracted to train his staff, right? And yeah. that should be right there, a flag for conflict of interest. You know, you know, Fatu, certain things can only happen in the Gambia. Mm. This would not have happened anywhere and the minister survives 24 hours. Now, Take that minister's case, put it on the side. Okay. Isn't there a national audit report on the former minister for local government? Yes. There is, a, there is an audit report Man, on yeah, him. Yeah. When, during his time as governor of Janjambure. Yeah. What, 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 what did the audit say? The audit says... He was awarding his own, co his own company contracts. About $7.5 seven, $7 million dollars yeah. is worth. Mm -hmm. And again, he says he's not aware, but the company is being led by his son. Yeah. So what is different from this guy? And, and, and as we speak, the ministry that he has led during his time, lands that have been allocated. allocated. Yep. Government came out with a strong statement to yeah. say 
they are putting on hold every work that is going on in those areas, Kamalo to be specific, yeah. and said, if you are allocated land around in this that area, area bring, your paper. bring your papers in two days. If not, you might lose it. Yeah. And it's the same minister, but he's still going around his business doing nothing. No, nothing happens. This is what I mean by there is no consequence management in this government. You can do what you need to do. There will be no consequences there. I remember when he was, he was removed, I had a Facebook Live that I was explaining, and me and Mustafa, and I kept saying, we know for a fact that it was, his removal was related to lands that were allocated in Kamalo areas. Yeah, and, and others. Uh, and, and others, and mm. people were saying, how do you know that? But obviously, it's now it's, coming, it's out. coming out. Now, yeah. you know, when the, when the minister made that, uh, that statement, mm -hmm. and, and it, it went to the public domain, you know what the comments were? Mm -hmm. Maybe he's just setting up people for more corruption, to give him what he wants. This is how cynical we have become. I said congratulations, but a guarded congratulations. Mm. And I hope the process is going to be transparent, yeah. it's going to be honest, it's going to be professional. Because that area, people don't realize, was one of the key drivers behind the Jawaras Banjul Declaration on the Environment. Yeah. It was one of it. Yeah. I was... I was new in the civil service at that time, relatively um, wet, sort of. Mm -hmm. But I remember that was one of the areas, uh, that one, Tanbi, uh, and, and the one in Bakau, Old Cape Road, that, that um, uh, surface area there. They were the ones that pushed him into this Banjul declaration to be, to be, to be made. So these are, these are lands that the state owns. And they are important in terms of maintaining the balance in our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Now, the minister comes and allocates that to the highest bidder. Mm -hmm. And he's walking free. And even when he was, he was, he was relieved, right, when he resigned, the, the, the statement from the presidency begs more questions. Than know, answers. Because they said he was, you know, the government, his his position as a cabinet minister and they quoted a specific section yeah and that specific section did say that if you did conduct. something a conduct that was unbecoming beyond unbecoming of, of a state minister, minister. Mm. so what did he do what did he do at this point he has gone to the board people asking i saw Mari wrote specific yeah. different uh, articles on that the government should tell us what did he do they will not they will not. But isn't Again, that not the right thing to do? It is the right thing to do. It is the transparent thing to do. And it is the honest thing to do. You know, Fatou, I, I said something here. I said from the uh, onset, mm -hmm. I said transparency and accountability are the Achilles heels of this borough government. Do you think Minister Usman Bas will resign? I, oh, I, I don't think he should just resign. I think he should pay back the money after resigning. And his company should be banned from getting any public uh, funds to, to survive. I think the same thing goes with ABBA. I think the same thing goes with all of them that have companies. The government will say, government, it takes time. ABBA, you, you have seen the um, Banja case. I saw people saying, well, Banja was uh, used as a scapegoat, just $50,000 or so. But wasn't he? He was sent to jail. Um, but now uh, ABBA has allocated these lands. Um, we don't and know he any has audit, audit wise allocated resources to his own. And the company. minister has allocated his company contracts worth over this, but he's still serving as minister. You see, Fatou, the reason why Gambians speculate a lot, the reason why they use insinuations and innuendos, is because their government is not transparent with them. Honestly, if the government was transparent with people and say, okay, Abba Sanyang, when he was governor of the central bank, the audit report says he's done A, B, C, D, and E. We're going to hold him accountable. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is to prefer charges against him. Let him defend himself in a court of law. You've done what you are supposed to do. If we have that kind of transparency, the kind of gossiping, insinuations, innuendos that you hear around issues will all die down. And we'll have a society that is based on fact, not on opinions. We have a society right now that is run on opinions. And you know how opinions can be. Yeah. They are very personal. The way you think, the information you have at your disposal mm -hmm. will form your opinion of things. Yeah. But if you have the facts around, around you, you yeah. 
you, you will make your own rational choice decisions to say this is based on fact and I accept it or I don't accept it. But unless transparency is frontally brought to this government, we can't have that. They, they, finally, I like to say they, they, the idea that those of us who criticize yeah. are criticizing because we like to criticize. I think that is the most fallacious yeah. of things that I've ever had in a political dispensation. People will talk, people will say things that they otherwise would not have said if there was justice, if there was honesty, if there was truthfulness in the way we conduct our, our national business. I, for one, I wasn't active politically. I was there when UDP was being formed, mm. but I wasn't active politically. A, because my contract with the UN has a particular stipulation there. Yeah. But I could have done it underground, yeah. and I have. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, when I came back in 2016, I came back because Yajame made it impossible for me to enjoy my country. Mm -hmm. And I came back. There is a journalist, a Gambian journalist, maybe he's listening to this thing. I was feeding him information. Even the issue of the, the uh, Security Council resolution, that draft, the vetting of the facts in it, I was, I was involved in that. Part of it. And we did it because we want change. Yeah. Now that change has happened, where are we yeah. now? It's, a, it's, like a neo, it's like a neo it's like a neo Yajame regime. It's like a neo Yajame regime because the people who've done those things for Yajame are the same people who are doing those these things uh, for for Baro. Sukai Dahaba, mm. when she talks about her torture, people like Nogoi, when they talk about their torture. And you listen to what the party leader has said about these old men being put to wear shorts and short sleeves in prison, degrading them. That was during Yaya's time. That's what is, not happening today. What is different now mm -hmm. is that they are going after targeted individuals instead of a system-wide network of gambiting, mm -hmm. they target individuals. You speak against us, you are our enemy. You are not in the same political party with us, you are our enemy. I'm saying no to that kind of behavior. Yeah. Because yeah. this is not about UDP or, or NPP. This is about the Gambia. Gambia. I tell people, when, when I left the UN, I had an option to go to X number of countries. Mm -hmm. I chose to come here. Why? Because I carry a Gambian passport. It's the only passport I carry. Yeah. So nobody can tell me, you love this country better than me. Yeah. It's not possible, especially when you have a double passport. Yeah. I don't have one. When systems collapse, I am here. Yeah. When systems make it, I am here. here. So why, what makes you think you have a monopoly over love of Gambia than me, yeah. simply because I'm criticizing you? If you do the right things, I will not criticize. And that has, that, that has been the norm. You know, when people criticize, uh, you are an enemy to the government. You are an enemy to progress. Is it, or you don't love the country? Yeah. Is, isn't it those criticisms that helps government to see their shortfalls? If I was a government or leader of a government, yeah. I'm particularly going to nurture those who criticize me because mm -hmm. I know they are not telling me things that I want to hear. Mm -hmm. They are telling me things that I need to hear. Now, you remember when Thomas Sankare came on the scene in Burkina Faso? Mm -hmm. A lot of people cried foul because he, he overthrew uh, uh, a government, uh, whether legitimately or illegitimately elected. Mm -hmm. But the fact was, a lot of noise was made. Yeah. But you know, one of the legacies that he had was he invested time and money in investigative journalists in Burkina Faso. And that is why... People don't realize that Burkina Faso has a very strong uh, investigative journalist tradition because Sankare made it possible. possible. Now, what's stopping our democratically elected government in investing in something like your outlet, the other outlets, uh, Malagan, Malagan is to, doing an to, amazing to, to say, job when it comes you know, to investigation. Investigate so. and tell us mm -hmm. those things that we know are not being told. Tell us. 
Now, that's the kind of openness I would like to see my government have. And it, it, it's, a, it's a utopian type thinking, because well, I don't think we'll achieve that in my lifetime. Uh, but maybe in my grandchildren's lifetime, we'll have it. I'm enjoying this conversation so much. I want to ask, can I ask one more question, Charles and team? I mean, <laughs> I'm enjoying the conversation, mm -hmm. but you know, and I see a lot of people say, we should bring this man so often. But finally, 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 Charles, mm -hmm. huh? you know, we have seen coup d'etats in the sub-region. Yeah. And especially the Francophone countries. countries. Mm -hmm. um, for a country like us, I know no Gambian ever wants a coup, wants a coup mm -hmm. going through what we, knowing went what we went through. Yeah. We, we don't want it. Yeah. But the trend in the Francophone countries that you see, why do you think... Uh, this is happening. A lot of people say, no, number one, it has to be the, uh, the colonial, the col how the colonial masters are taking uh, charge of their economies and they manipulate their systems. Others say how presidents change the constitutions to suit them mm. and nobody says anything and then the military because when i see people celebrating coup d'etats in these countries i'm thinking I know. do they really know, know what coup d'etats are we I went know. through the one right i know but for people to celebrate coup d'etats like that in those countries why do you think that is happening i, I it's a combination of all three things mm. one uh, France had signed, I think, a series of agreements with this francophone, con ten, yeah. of, 10 of them. Mm -hmm. And each one of them is more draconian than the yeah. other. Now, take a look at Niger. Mm -hmm. Niger's uh, uranium is costing France about 8 cents a kilo. When Canadian uranium is costing 200, 200 euros. Yeah, this was now, for, since independence, Niger has been supplying France this commodity and other commodities. Mm -hmm. And so are the rest of the Francophone countries who are part of this safer zone. They actually pay tax to France. So France made a mistake in not re reforming its relationship with its former colonies and taking care of these uh, draconian economic agreements that were signed during De Gaulle's time, Mitterrand's time, and uh, Gestad Gestang's time. They made a mistake in not reviewing that. Um, I have a European friend. Uh, he, he was a senior official in one of the European countries who keeps telling me, but you are quiet on this thing. And I, I sent to him, I said, you know, I am quiet. Mm -hmm. I am saddened to say, but France made a mistake. They should have reviewed and reformed this thing. And I forwarded the 10 agreements to him. Yeah. When he got it and read it, he, he called me on the phone. Mm -hmm. He says, no. I said, go and investigate. He investigated. Just last week, he came back to me. He says, I'm ashamed. Because he's half French and half another, another country. country. But he's an internationalist so, yeah. and stuff. Now, then you have this issue of um, election integrity, free, fair, transparent elections. Our leaders mm -hmm. don't realize that people want fairness. They want honesty in mm -hmm. their election system. They want to be able to say, I elected Fatu in this office. Mm -hmm. And they don't want their, that elected person to be questioned because the integrity issue has been taken care of. If you don't take care of that, and you have a young population, Africa's median population is about 16. Mm -hmm. Now, that demographic dividend, our leaders tend to ignore. Now, up to 30% of that in each country is unemployed. What do you expect? When they overthrow a person that they see in the name person of uh, Gabon's Bongo yeah. with millions of dollars Cash stashed line, away yeah. everywhere, yeah. His, his crony is the same thing. Why wouldn't they celebrate? At that point, the consequences of militarism does not enter their psychology. Mm. What is entering their psychology is that one injustice has been taken care of. Never mind the method. We will deal with the method and the consequences of that method later. later. But the injustice has been taken care of. Now, what is, what is troubling is that when you look at the Francophone zone mm -hmm. from Morocco coming down to uh, Mauritania, mm -hmm. Central Africa, Gabon, all the Francophone countries, they are all in the same mess. Yeah. And you know what? These countries will have to reform or they will all go through the same process again and again and again until they get it right. 
Now, in our own case here, I keep saying what what is happening in Senegal should be of concern to us. Yeah, it should be. It should be of concern to us because, uh, like they say, when Senegal catches a cold, we d we, die. we die. When they sneeze, yeah, we we catch a cold. We catch a cold. So the governance framework in Senegal has an important link and bearing to the governance situation in this country. Now, do you know that some people, when Yankuba was arrested, were saying, oh, Makisala has done the same thing, so why not Baro? Yeah. So if I was Baro, I don't want to be compared to that. To that, yeah. It's and I've said this before, over and over and over again. I was following Makisal from the time he was a minister to when he became prime, prime minister, minister. To a speaker. To a speaker and to all opposition. of that. opposition. Yeah. When he launched this Senegal Imajan, mm -hmm. honestly, when I read the document, I said, huh, finally, yeah. we have vision uh, from an African country that is going to take us somewhere. Yeah. And he went ahead and plucked on it. Yeah. He achieved. Yes. Now, all of that legacy is it's being cancelled out because of the way he's how he has things. changed, how Maki has changed from what he has done infrastructure wise and even the projects, the, 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 the what he has brought to Senegal and how yeah. he has changed to become somebody who just wants to eliminate anybody who is opposing him is, is mind blowing. You, you know, self perpetuation is a disease. Hmm. It's a disease. It's a psychological disease. I, I thought Maki would have had the highest honor among all African leaders yeah. if he had left honorably. Living honorably would be what? Conducting free, fair, transparent elections. Where everybody is included. Where everybody is included and the people decide who they want to live. Now, a lot of people are saying that's not possible in Senegal because deals have been made. Mm -hmm. Now, what those deals are, I don't know. No, no, uh, but Mr. Sise, for example, Karim Wad went to jail. Yeah. He has been accused of embezzling billions, billions of, of taxpayer money. money. Now, today, because you want to make a deal with them, you pardon him, yeah. and he's not going to pay that money, he's yeah. allowed to run. He's allowed to run. Halifa Salah, who the has same. been accused of Kesh Noir, mm. went to jail, yeah. because now you have a deal with them, you you allow him to run without paying. Usman Sonko, who has not eaten a dime, is walked, clean. walked at the empo at them on the tax mm. for f over 15 years, yeah has never been accused of anything. He said, if I've ever eaten anything, bring it on. Nobody, you you want to disqualify that person and allow all these people that your government has accused of corruption. And, and locked up. To, and locked up to yeah. run. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the, that, that's the mind-blowing question everybody, that, a lot of Senegalese that's what, that's are asking. I, that's why I'm saying, mm. um, my, my Senegalese friends, I have some, some very close friends mm -hmm. from Senegal in the UN system. Yeah. They used to laugh at me about Yaya Jame and curing AIDS and killing and stuff. Now I'm laughing at them I and know. saying, you see, it's a disease. Yeah. Uh, we caught it. We thought we have gotten rid of it. We haven't caught it totally. But you are now suffering it in the most brutal way possible. Yeah. It got to a point where more killing beer con six second and call him. Yeah. Nigga thinking I don't buy a cavalry no 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 boom. Because they couldn't see the rationale behind the metam metamorphosis that Maki has taken. taken. The question is why would you go to that extent to destroy this fantastic legacy that you have? Why? And the same question can be asked of our president here. Why would you want your legacy? You took a dictator on. You defeated him. You committed to doing reforms that you haven't been doing or you are doing half-heartedly. What is holding you? What is holding you? Me, I want Baro to answer that. What is holding him? What is holding him? Because that is, that is the gateway to his legacy. When you talk to the government, I had one minister here, he said, Fatu, security sector reform is ongoing. Hey. Uh, we did the TRRC, uh, we, we, you know, implementation has started. We did the truth, com the uh, JANE commission was done. We have recovered some of JAME's assets and sold them. Um, the draft constitution was done, it was thrown out by the assembly. We have done everything that we have promised. I, no, they have, not done, they have not done everything they had promised. Uh, if you take any one of those issues, the, why, the reason why I use half-heartedly, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm You're couching. You're very careful the, the words you half -heartedly. use, half-heartedly. Yeah. 
It's not like they are not doing it. Mm. They are doing it, but not at a pace and at a speed and at a transparency level that people can actually say, yes, they are doing well. Take the, take the Jana Commission. Yeah. It was very clear what yeah. happened. Yeah. Now you go, you, you ban other people, you give jobs to other people, you selectively implement because their recommendations, mm -hmm. and you say, I'm implementing it. Come on. You are not implementing it. We have people in Batokunku who have properties there. They invested millions there. Yeah. And their properties are still not being given to them. Yeah. And you call that implementing a, a commission's report. TRRC, how many people have been uh, pointed at in terms of the atrocities and human rights violations that have been committed who are still walking the streets, enjoying what everybody else fought and cried for, and no consequences? So I, I use my words carefully by saying half-hearted way of implementing these things. Because it's like cherry picking. You have a cake with a bunch of things in it and you cherry pick which one you want to eat, which one you want to put aside. This is what he is doing. Larry Sise, thank you so much for this interesting conversation. You definitely have to come back. I will. We want to, we want to hear from people like you to give us an overview as to what is happening. These are frank conversations that Gambians want to hear. And I see a lot of people here out here telling us this is the kind of matured and intellectual conversations they want to hear uh, political caps off. And this is interesting. Yes. Your, I, yeah, final message. Yeah. I, I, I keep saying to people, mm -hmm. uh, politics aside, yeah. Gambians, we are all interconnected. One way or the other, yeah. culturally, linguistically, traditionally, even ethnically. Mm -hmm. That cannot be interpreted to mean that we cannot symbiotically live side by side, even with our political differences and, and synagogues. Mm -hmm. We can. This is a very religious, pious country. At least it used to be. Yeah. Uh, there are things that you can say do not happen in this country. Mm -hmm. They are happening now. This, this floodgate of corruption that is going on, Gambia has not known that before Jame. Jame has taken it to another level. But I keep saying, Barrow's corruption, when everything is said and done, will make Jame's corruption look like child's play. Mm -hmm. You know why I'm saying it? Yeah. I'm not being bitter, I'm not being selfish, I'm not being even coy about it. I make a habit of doing my, my homework. I research things. Do you know that on average, mm -hmm. I go to the National Audit uh, website three times a week. Wow. I have downloaded all of their reports, 48 of them. I put them on a flash drive and I read them. Sometimes when I read them, I don't go to sleep because of the pilferage that is going on. That is unprecedented in this country. The Gambia has never known that. Two. The sense of community is breaking down. The individual, the yeah. individualism that is coming out of this corruption is destroying our sense of community. And our politics has also it, it has destroyed. It has destroyed whatever little is left in our traditional social and cultural networks. Yeah. It's now me, my tribe, my region. Yeah. In that order, me, my tribe, my region. I mean, what society can thrive in a, in a milieu like that? The, the countries that ten, tend to thrive better are the ones that are inclusive, that are diverse, and that are honest in the way they deal with one another. I have neighbors. We greet each other every day and stuff. But the traditional bonds, that neighborhood when we got there in, in 1995, it's not there anymore. No. Everybody's got a high wall and you close your gate. That kinship is not there anymore. Even in Kudam, yeah. in other places around the country, they are polarizing us to a point where the, the communities themselves have become toxic. And I don't think politics is worth that. No, it's not. Power is not worth that. If you have power and you create polarity in society, you're going to answer for that. 
fodi fodi karanal buka fo nyeko alaka ala ala nyaton ko la be kitindi la separately mm -hmm. munati na be kitindi la separately because mm -hmm. they have a particular responsibility, responsibility. Wow, somebody is saying, don't forget about deportation, but I ran out of time already. <laughs> but your party leader is accused of signing the MOU, though. But what did he say but, in the last but the, press the, the, the But the, 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 the Minister of Foreign Affairs came to the National Assembly. He said this MOU, nothing, an agreement has not been signed, yeah. but the MOU was done in 2018, and that time that was the... He was the affairs. foreign minister, yeah. but he wasn't even in the country. Okay. Let us be fair to the man. I'm a sign. Mm -hmm. Now sign. Let them bring out the papers. Cartel sign. Ha. When when that thing was being signed with the EU delegate, mm -hmm. Hussein was in Abidjan at mm -hmm. the ADB. Mm -hmm. He wasn't even in the country. He saw it being signed like we all saw it being signed. The question is who signed it and where is it? For me, at this point, I even say, I don't think at this point it's about who even signed it. How can we stop it? Can we go and revisit this agreement? And the funny thing is the minister brought this agreement to the National Assembly, this, the Spanish-Swiss um, uh, MOU. It was for the National Assembly yeah. consumption mm. and the speaker mistakenly brought it to the assembly floor. That's and what you came, get when you have an incompetent individual. <laughs> and he came back and to withdraw it. <laughs> but what is in that document? Why do we have that kind of agreement? Do we know as a people? We are already complaining about deportations. You know, for me, when I had, um, who did I have here the other day? Uh, Dr. Sidat Job, he yeah. said, we should be able to go back to the EU and go back to the drawing board. I listened to one of the deportees and the, one of the migrant officers that was on the political kacha, mm -hmm. and he was talking about how Gambia should go and renegotiate because there are other countries who have their people in Germany and other countries, and they are not being deported. Listen, nothing is sacrosanct. Mm. We should ask the question, who signed that MOU? Who signed it? And like the party leader said, it's at foreign affairs. Let them bring it out. I keep saying Fatu, people don't... Documents are here. They, yeah, people, yeah, people don't take me seriously when I say, mm -hmm. bring out the contracts. Because the contracts are going to be self-explanatory. Mm. They are going to be self-explanatory. Now, if they had brought out who signed that thing, we would have known who signed it. Yeah. Then we can go to the next step of how do we uh, comport ourselves to bring it back to the negotiating table so that a more fairer deal can be struck on behalf of our citizens. Now, if you have a government that is not even thinking that, uh, how is it going to be renegotiated? You know, somebody, somebody, when, when you announced that I was coming here, somebody sent me an email to say, but whose foreign policy is Gambia depending on? Uh, the former vice president said we don't have a foreign policy. Well. <laughs> that's the former vice that's, president. That's Badara's Badara. basic honesty and decency. Yeah. Um, he, he, he say Him saying that doesn't surprise me. Mm. But my answer to this individual was, the foreign minister does not have a foreign policy. The foreign policy is the president's foreign policy. Mm. Oh, yes. The box stops with the president. The box, yes. That's true. So, it's not Tangara's foreign policy. It's Barrow's foreign policy. Okay. And let's, let's leave it at that. If he wants it to renegotiate, there are people here who can help the government renegotiate these things and come out with a deal that is fair to our people. But until that happens, again, this blaming people, insinuations, opinions, innuendos, the lack of transparency is what drives that. Yeah. And it, I think uh, it's important we know what are in these contracts, yes. what are the agreements, what are the partnerships. Yes, so that the parameters. Gambians, we know everything. Mm -hmm. I think those things are important. E even this uh, asset recycling. Mm -hmm. Most countries that do it, they have an, uh, an act of parliament called the Public-Private Partnership Act. Yeah. It, it, it will guide you in, in, in establishing the contours of what is feasible and what is not feasible. What is practicable in the law, what is not practicable in the law. Do we have a PPP Act in this country? No, we don't. I have investigated it everywhere. I couldn't find one agreement or one act of parliament that says this, are the, this is the act that will define our asset recycling or our public-private partnership arrangements. It's not there. It's not there. Uncle Larry, thank you so much for this uh, interesting conversation. Final message to the government, the people of the Gambia. 
Final message is this. Um, we've gotten to a point where, mm -hmm. and I keep saying this, uh, we've gotten to a point where mm -hmm. uh, the president needs to assume leadership of uh, making it possible to engage all the political parties and come up with uh, 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 a consensus view mm -hmm. on how to take the country back on track. Mm -hmm. That is, if he agrees that the country is not on track. Okay. Uh, there is nothing that would stop him from calling any of these political leaders and saying, let's chat and see how best we can take the country out of the mess that it is in. Now, some time ago, I appeared on another thing and the same question was asked, why didn't UDP call the president? Yeah. yeah it, it, we've done it once before. The party leader had called during uh, COVID in 2021. He, yeah, had COVID. Called, he had called all the uh, opposition party leaders yeah. and said, COVID is a, is a global issue. Mm -hmm. Let us get together and make contact with State House so that we can together sit and guide the way we can handle, navigate this COVID mm -hmm. thing. You know, somebody recorded him, went and played it at State House to mean that Usain is looking for favors for a job. Oh. This is why I keep saying the president knows Usainu's number, he knows Halifa's number, he knows Mama Kande's number, let him call them. These people, I am sure, will put the best interest of the country before their own interest or Barrow's interest. If he calls them, they will answer. And do you think that is that's, that would be one of the one of the one of the solutions to the issues that we are in? Whether okay. it's uh, um, uh, how do we tackle our governance system? Okay. How do we tackle our legal system to make it fairer, more inclusive, more representative? All of those things can be discussed. You know, elections come and go. Yeah, governments come and go. Mm. The country stays. The country stays. So if if we can't work together like that then we are not fit to be where we are. Yeah. Thank you very much, Uncle Rare. Uh, Baraka Bake. This is an interesting conversation, and I know my viewers, a lot of people are saying they have enjoyed this conversation, and Good. I hope we can have more of these conversations. Now we, we are not going to let you stay. I mean, <laughs> I have Seku Kamarako. Uh, ko, this is the only C Sekunda he listens to. He you know Sekunda Koda Matimiaonga Kela Moimina. But I must also say this is the only uncle C Sekunda that I will listen to. But uh, thank you very much for this well, uh, insightful conversation. Very interesting. I hope the authorities will also take one or one or two things from this and for the interest of the country and you know I hope so too. I hope so. Uh, I hope Gambia so. can be both nice, enjoyable and the small heaven that it is, it um, is if we do it right if we do it right uh, and we can it do it yeah we can, we do, can it. do it no question no about question that. about that thank you very much uncle larry and thank to you. you all watching thank you very thank much you. to my technical team charles siri mm -hmm. farcilla mommy and all of you thank you so much for being there for us until we come your way next week inshallah good night to you all good see you next week with another person and definitely a political leader you want to hear from. Good night. See you Good. next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay.
yirwa men kafata na taram buloluto nga GIA cargo complex parendile proka julaya sone yandi kadungoni mfunti bunda na doko sembentu ya banjul international airport oto mensi nyafa si moluma melka fengoluki bantala bankolu kang anin julandingo lufana faisi sula na kago doko lale bang katu masingolu bembulule ikafume ye forklifts melka selendiro ni njindiro ke baka solula melbe funti kang waranto kaduna na warehouse olukono nga dinkira sumayari ngolu fana sotole ifula mila fano mu metari kemeleti karo bela adung isi kago baka solu tanul mensi ta for ton town war ila sumaya fana futata tembeleto menka fendolu mabono fo ikana atinya fo sene fengolu lombang domori fengolu waranto jata kendea ni mbori ma fengolu kago baka solu la taradula kendo asulata jama ni laban korosir langolu lela na double view extra korosir la masingolu aka kago baka so kono kono jubele komi kago do kuo sartoli ya landi nyameng nyin double view extra amu jama ni laban rapid scanner leti menka karafula korosiro keno kago sifa bela wati kilingo kono to na doku lalo imu ayata karandingo leti mili yela doku wo no iframansata kago doku wo na tamandiri nyato na doku wo la bete ya Wayem futan di RA3 makamoleto mensa tinna fo nse kago bagaso lu kinole kata UK and EU banko lu kan GIA ka hakeli tenkongo dilan na doku woto ite nyina la men Every day is a new opportunity to make sure our first impressions are always our best and to see possibilities on the horizon to make our facilities and services more accessible and find freedom all around us. With a location proximity to active markets, with a liberal air transportation policy, that daily pursuit is how we turn everyday opportunities for you. For all destination marketing support, customized packages for new existing airlines and operators, and for a highly ranked tourist destination, the Gambia Civil Aviation Authority is here to serve. We regulate air transport, operate and manage BIA technical requirements, merge with commercial considerations. We have experienced and well-trained aviation professionals to cater for your needs. For investment opportunities in building airport hotels, shopping malls, playground for children, do contact us on 4472-831, 4472-893. Gambia Civil Aviation Authority. We go beyond daily.